let's give maybe thank you carly let's give maybe a minute for people to trickle in um Okay, um, let's get started. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the first Dent Echo session of 2023. Um, before we begin, I would like to let everyone know that this session is being recorded. Um, these recordings will become available on our Echo website post session. Uh, we are very excited to have all of you join us for the 12th Dent Echo. Uh, we have a wonderful didactic and case presentation lined up for you today. Um, my name is Kato and I will assist in facilitating today's session. Um, for those who may be new to ECHO, this is a model that builds virtual communities of practice and learning. Um, sessions begin with a didactic presentation followed by a de-identified case-based learning and group discussion to foster deep knowledge and build individual capacity. Uh, before we move on to introductions, a uh, few IT-related reminders. Uh, please stay muted unless you are speaking. You can use star six on your phone if you've called in or the microphone icon on the bottom left of your screen if you've joined on a computer. You can also communicate with the chat feature. Please remember that no personal health information is allowed when discussing cases and scenarios. We are recording these sessions and we'll make them available after the session. Um, if you would like to view closed captioning for this session, please navigate to the bottom of your Zoom window and select the show captions option. Um, you may need to click on more at the bottom right corner of your Zoom screen to find this menu. If you are having any trouble with your tech or seeing the captions, please um, chat Carly. Um, okay, so let's move on to the introductions. Um, Dr. Chala. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, uh, coming in today. I'm Suman Chala, so as the principal investigator on this HRSA uh, grant that supports this activity, and uh, so as the associate dean for advanced education programs. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Chala. Um, Dr. Aguilar? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Rosalie Aguilar. I am one of the Dent Echo co directors. Welcome. Thank you. And Professor De La Torre. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Dent Echo. We're really excited to have Brian Ross speak. He's a previous uh, alumni. He is an alumni of our program here and graduated from dental school here. And I um, am a faculty and I'm really excited to be one of the co-directors of Dent Echo. And last but not least, our didactic presenter, Dr. Ross. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Brian Ross. Um, like Ms. Delatore said, I'm a, I'm a former student that graduated here in 2018. Um, and I'm coming back and I'm actually doing radiology residency now. So that's why I'm kind of affiliated with uh, kind of the talk today. So yeah, thanks for coming everybody. Thank you. Um, and a few announcements before we move on to Dr. Ross's presentation. Um, to everyone who's joined this session, please enter your name, title, and affiliation into the chat to help us with attendance and so that we can get to know each other through chat. Um, if you haven't already completed the pre-session questionnaire, you can do this now using the link in the chat box. Um, and to receive CDE credits, registration is required through the UT Health CDE website. Uh, we will also follow up by email with instructions for completing the post-session evaluation and attaining your credits post-session. ECHO is an all-teach, all-learn supported model, and ECHOs thrive on the introduction from the full learning network. So we encourage all to participate in the conversation today. We also encourage you to join by video if you can, especially during the discussion portion of the session. Our session today will include a didactic and case presentation from Dr. Ross on exploring dental opportunities in underserved areas. And as a reminder, you can use the chat to raise questions and comment um, at any point during the session. Um, and that's it from me, um, Dr. Ross, when you're ready, um, please share your slides and please take it away. All right, sounds good. Make sure I click these buttons correctly. All right, can you guys see my screen there? Look good? Let's do full size. There we go, okay, all right. Well, thank you everybody for coming. It's um it's my first time doing an online lecture. Let me click back there. Cool. Okay. So 
Um, like we mentioned earlier, my name is Brian Ross. Um, I graduated dental school here in San Antonio in 2018. Um, I worked for about four years after that, kind of doing a bunch of different things. And this talk is kind of talking about some of those different things that I did after graduation. Um, this is, like I mentioned, this is my first online talk. I see a couple of faces on my, on my right side. So I see some people kind of giving a little bit of head nods, things like that. So thanks for those that have your cameras on. Um, normally I'm used to having a little bit of a crowd that I can kind of go off the energy from. So this is a little different, but here we go. Let's get it started. So um, this is me as a kid. So hopefully you guys can see my mouse pointer. I'm this guy right here. Um, so I grew up in a small town of about a thousand people. Um, grew up in a trailer house on a farm. Had some pretty humble beginnings. Um, this is my family that came to graduation or as it's also called commencement. This is my brother here. Um, I was listening to a Joe Rogan podcast the other day, I think, and Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, made sure to comment and called it a commencement. So something I hadn't really thought about. You notice that it's called commencement, but you don't think about it. Commencement means beginning. So typically when we think of graduation, maybe we say, hey, this is the end of a journey. This is whatever. But in reality, it's the beginning of something different. It's the finishing of something and the moving forward to something else. So when I, when I finished graduation, I gave a speech there. I was president of my class. Um, and then from then on, we commenced kind of our next step, which was kind of getting out and about. So this was this was me as a kid as well. So another quick picture. So sorry for any vegans that are watching. Um, the the place I grew up in was pretty humble, small. Um, we didn't have that much access to healthcare in general. Um, so anytime that we would need, anytime I would go to the hospital with an injury from football or whatever it may be, it was at least a thirty to forty five minute drive to a hospital. Or hey, I have a toothache or something like that. It was at least a thirty plus minute drive. So one of my passions when I got out of school was I want to go to these places that have lack of access to care and help them get more of it. So here's here's a little bit of a little bit of background on that as well. Um, I got a scholarship when I first started dental school um, for ten thousand dollars, which was the cost of my house growing up as a kid. Um, it was kind of a funny. It, it was an interesting thing to have gotten that scholarship because I was like, man, is this a mistake? Like, do they know that they're talking to some little kid from a farm? They're not talking to some super smart guy who's going to bring all these crazy things, but for whatever reason, they gave me a scholarship. And from that point on, I kind of saw it as a sign that, hey, if if, if you're going to be given some of these things in life, you need to give back. So th it's been a passion that's kind of been in the back of my mind since I've been as young as I can. I always knew I wanted to kind of move forward. So I graduated 2018 and hit the ground running doing general dentistry, cosmetics, implants, the whole thing. Um, kind of took a lot of classes on my own, learned a lot of things to get better and better. So this was a class that I actually, or this was a case that I did in school with Dr. Van. So she was um, the pre-prosthetic program director and was the geriatrics director. We did a lot of really cool cases for a lot of these people and kind of helped them get kind of back in a position where they could get dentures or they could get some kind of prosthetic um, replacement for their teeth. Because a lot of these patients that we had were in failing dentition. They were having a hard time just even doing regular things from chewing, speaking, um, anything like that. So we kind of helped even some of these harder cases, for example, this one, you can see the bone that's kind of on the sides of some of these teeth it was a little too much to make a good, good fitting denture. So we did a lot of stuff where we had re kind of reshape the bone and kind of give the patients a little bit better canvas to build dentures on. Um, this was an immediate implant that I did. Uh, I think it was about a year, year out of school. So the, the company I was working for, I went back to kind of work in the Austin area, which is where I'm from. Um, they, they gave us a couple of classes where we learned um, kind of implant fundamental stuff and learned a lot of that. So this was a really cool case um, of an immediate implant that we did. Um, here's an implant case that I actually did on my mom. So my mom had a baby tooth right here. So it was a retained primary tooth from a long time ago and just kind of over time got a little bit loose. Um, and so she said, hey, one of these days I'm going to bite an apple and I'm going to be walking around without a tooth. Can we do something about it? So thankfully, we were able to take that tooth out and kind of thread the needle of that implant right through that little little spot that we had and then over time we got her the final crown so this is hopefully going to be one of my good long-term follow-up cases that i have in the future um, this is another case of a wisdom tooth that was kind of sitting a little too sideways so for those of you that are watching that still have your wisdom teeth thinking oh it's fine oh it's fine eventually depending on the situation there, there's a lot of cases where i'll see people that just kind of left their wisdom teeth ah, it's okay it's not bothering me now it bothered me back then but it's good it'll end up causing different types of issues from it can cause, there's kind of debatable malocclusion. It can cause different different types of external resorption or caries that it can destroy the tooth in front of it and just can kind of swell up and do some other things as well. So I'm a pretty big uh, advocate for getting wisdom teeth out early if you can. So you know who you are, you know who you are who's listening. So, so this is one thing that whenever I got out of school, 
I kind of, I spent a lot of time thinking about what my goals were, probably more than most people. I, I would sit around after work and think, man, what, what are my goals? What am I aiming at? And something I wanted to encourage anybody who's listening is whenever you have your goals, it's easier to kind of aim at something and to have a, have a driven motivation to kind of go and achieve it. So defining your goals aren't something that can be defined by someone else. So other people can have a little influence, say, hey, for example, me, me telling you this, like, hey, here's some things that I've done. Here's things that I recommend that you can do to improve yourself, but your goals are yours. So don't, don't let anybody's influence, if it's not your own, affect what your goals may be. So whenever I went, got out of school and went back to the Austin area, I kind of was just thinking, like I mentioned, what are my goals? What are my goals? And finally, there was just the day where I said, I need to do something different. So I ended up kind of stumbling upon this map. Um, this is a map showing health professional shortage areas throughout the United States. And I kind of zoomed in more over here. So I kind of zoomed in on the kind of island and kind of different populations. And then Puerto Rico's over here. You guys' faces are blocking that, but somewhere over here. Um, so the, the islander population was always something that even as a kid, we'd be filling out surveys or we'd be taking our standardized tests and I'd say, what population or what, what is your ethnicity? And then I would see Native Hawaiian, um, Alaska Native, things like that. And it was always like, man, this is interesting. These are parts of the United States, but we're not really taught enough about it. We're not taught how these people have such a different culture, how they have a different, different look, how they have a different bloodline, genetics, all these things. So even in our medical classes, we learn genetic predispositions and things like that. They are part of the United States, but their, their genetic diversity is so much different than mainland United States people or other things like that. So I kind of focused on this area here when I was thinking, what are my next goals? And I said, you know, I want to go work in underserved areas in these places. Um, so the health, the health professional shortage area scores range from one to 26. So a lot of these island populations have the maxed out score of 26 just due to the lack of education programs that are there. So a lot of times, um, most times what, what ends up being is that the people from these places are foreign born. So most of the people that are dentists in American Samoa are not Samoan. Most of the people that are dentists in the Northern Mary Islands are, are not Chamorro people. They, they kind of have to get educated elsewhere and come back. Even in Hawaii, there's not a dental school. So a lot of times, the not a, not a lot of times, all of the dentists there specifically were not trained as a dentist in Hawaii. There is a pharmacy school, there is I think a medical school, but there's no dental schools. So all the times that there is a dentist in Hawaii, it's not that they were trained there. So they had to had to come to the United States if they were Native Hawaiian and then go back, or they were trained in the U.S. and then went there just kind of as a transplant or as an immigrant, if you will. So I focused on that population. So. Um, so then my first place that I went to was in Honolulu. So this is the main kind of hub. I would call it the hub of the Pacific. So there's access to um, nice hospitals, oral surgeons. There's all kinds of different dental professionals and health professionals in Honolulu specifically. So a lot of times on the outer islands that I showed you before in the slide, slide before, it had the different island populations. If they had a big surgery or if they needed a knee replacement or if they needed some kind of big surgery, oftentimes they wouldn't do it on their island. So a lot of times... Um, they would send those bigger cases to Honolulu to get done. So Honolulu was kind of the main hub of kind of the Pacific where the big cases go to, and that's kind of where the main hospitals and training programs are. Um, so whenever I went, I worked as a, um, just kind of a full-time dentist at a, at a health clinic that was kind of in the heart of Honolulu itself. Um, I also was an AGD resident supervisor, which was kind of interesting because I was only, I think, a year and a half out of school at the time. but Pretty quickly, I was already overseeing residents and kind of looking at their separate cases, teaching them more about the fundamentals of endo and things like that. So it was, it was, a, it was a good role to have. So our patient population there ranged from everywhere from homeless to um, there, was, there was a patient that I was hoping to see who was kind of a community figure. I can't really say too much without giving away HIPAA stuff, but essentially COVID had hit when I was there. And then the next week, we had a patient that was scheduled who I had heard his name and other things. I was excited to meet him and then COVID changed the game, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But we had a mix of all races and populations, everything from white, Latino, Native, Native Hawaiian, Hispanic, Black, everybody. So we had all kinds of populations there. And we actually did see a lot of HIV and AIDS patients. Um, also a few patients that were hep C and other kind of bigger, bigger health conditions. And Ryan White is a government fund set aside for HIV and AIDS patients. So they would come in 
um, fill out the paperwork for all that stuff. And then they would even get free, um, free or reduced care as a result of that government funding. And this was a FQHC or a federally qualified health center. Okay. And then there's that. And so this was, this was some footage that I took. It was going to go, there we go. Um, I think just on a random weekend, I had took my drone with me and just kind of on occasion would just go see beautiful things on weekends and just kind of relax when I was there. Um, these are some of the cases that we would see when, when I was at that um, health clinic specifically. We'd have a lot of patients who would come in kind of off the street and like, hey, we have this, I have this big thing. It's, I don't really know what it is, but it's bothering me. We would take an x-ray and it would be a dental abscess that would have transcended into different fascial spaces and different spaces that can cause problems. So this one specifically was an upper tooth infection that was kind of starting to sneak up his eyelid. It started to kind of swell and that kind of thing. So this was a pretty emergent case that I'm glad that he came in and saw us. But there's a lot of these kind of things that we would see. This is the same thing, but kind of lower jaw, same thing, lower tooth infection, started closing up his airway, that kind of thing, and came in and we immediately um, called EMS and had them kind of take care of him from there. So we would see a lot of these cases um, pretty regularly. It wasn't an uncommon thing that we had a, a case that kind of was a more important that, hey, it's a little infected, it's a problem. It would turn into a big problem really quickly. So we were kind of one of the front lines of seeing that. Um, so when I was here, um, COVID-19 had hit full force. I think it was March, 2020, April, 2020, that kind of thing. I was still here when that happened. So I'd, I'd call home and my family would say, hey, all the grocery stores are out of toilet paper. They're out of this, they're out of that. And for the most part, the Hawaiian islands were pretty calm. Um, but one of the issues was because it is so dependent on export and import to kind of maintain the population that people were getting a little concerned about it. But um, when COVID hit, the way that it worked was most of the hand pieces in the entire planet pretty much had to be kind of put down. It's the little picture on the right. Um, they, they had to kind of be put aside. And so any loose tooth that was there or any other really simple non aerosol producing procedure we could do. But if there was aerosol production, we couldn't do it. Um, so if there were loose teeth and patients would come in, we could kind of do what we need to do to get it out. But if there was a question that it may turn into a surgical extraction, we weren't really supposed to do it. So everybody was kind of stressed about the whole COVID thing. And meanwhile, this was me just on a random Tuesday, hanging out, doing my thing. So there's that. And then this was on Mount Akea. This is the, the largest, um, the largest mountain, I think, technically in the world. It's not the tallest because it, it's, it's a different base than Everest and all those other ones, but it's the biggest in terms of just sheer size. So this is on the big island of Hawaii, like I said. And uh, so you could throw a snowball and surf in the same day, technically, if you really wanted to. So this was kind of a cool thing. So you got to pack appropriately. Um, also, this was a, something you probably shouldn't do drinking and driving, but with coconut water. So it's a habit I picked up. Just kidding. Um, and this is climbing a coconut tree over here on the other side as well. So then my next one, this was going to um, Maui. So this is one of the neighboring islands. Um, this was also a really nice community clinic that really served the community really well. Um, we saw a lot of patients. They had a pediatric program. Um, we saw a lot of even outer island people. So people from Tonga, Tahiti, and the Samoas, all the different, all the different outer islands that weren't technically part of the U.S. but still have an affiliation, Marshallese, uh, Marshall Island people. Um, we saw a lot of those people as well. So we had a lot of really hard working construction workers that would come in and a lot of different people would come in on their lunch breaks. Hey man, I got this tooth that's killing me. I got to get back to work, things like that. So um, we had a really nice clinic here. We had a, a cone beam CT, which is a 3D x-ray machine. So we could do a little bit harder endodontic and extraction cases. We could get a little bit better grasp on kind of what we were looking at. Um, it was a really well-funded center and the AGD and PEDS residents have since returned. But when I was there, Still kind of during the height of COVID, the, the residency programs weren't in effect. So that's something that's come back, thankfully. So now they can kind of serve more people there. Here's a couple of cases. Um, this is one in particular. This was kind of a unique one because the patient had heard before um, that um, orthognathic surgery was a good option for her, but she didn't really have somebody explain it well to her. So I spent a lot of time talking to her about, hey, here's the things we can do. Um, we probably want to send you to Honolulu to get it done. There'd be flights involved, all these things. A little complex scenario, but she had loosely heard it, but she wanted to hear more about it. She said, hey, I have these dental problems. I've heard that they can do some kind of jaw surgery stuff. What do you think? So we kind of talked a little bit about the different benefits that we could have with that. But um, some of these places to, to get these things done, like I said, flying to Honolulu, getting all the accommodations, doing all these things was a pretty tough thing. So 
it was nice being able to kind of inform people that, but not being able to do it was kind of tough. So that, that was something that kind of pulled on my heart of, Hey, here's things that you need done, but we don't have the facilities. We don't have the people with the training here to do it. Um, so this was again, just kind of some other nice pictures. This was a common, a common scene that I would see. There's some surfers here in the water. You can see, um, this was kind of a really nice spot that I would just kind of hang out and watch the sunsets. Anytime I would be surfing in here, there were turtles everywhere. So you'd just be surfing, whatever, hanging out, sitting on the board, watching, and then a fin would come up next to you. And it doesn't matter how many times you see a fin pop out of the water. It still freaks you out if you're sitting on a surfboard. So the difference between a shark and a turtle is pretty big, but a fin popping out of nowhere and a big loud sound is still scary. Um, so this was the staff that worked at that office there. Um, this was actually a trauma case. So a patient had come in and landed on her front teeth from a fall. And thankfully they were, they were still intact. They were a little loose and they were starting to abscess. So we did two root canals on those to kind of help hopefully seal those up because the nerves were definitely severed when she did that. So thankfully they were still firm in the alveolus. Um, so we did that. And then here, so this is where Hawaii is on a map. I'm sure most of us are pretty familiar with this area over here. Here's Hawaii on a map. And the next place that I went was even a whole nother distance between mainland United States and Hawaii. Do another one of those west, and then you'll find the Northern Mariana Islands. So this is um, near Guam. I'm sure most of you've heard of Guam. Um, this is an island called Saipan that I went to. So the way I kind of identify it is I kind of use this point in Queensland, Australia and go straight up and just kind of find it in the middle from the Philippines. So most times it doesn't show on a map because it is such a small island chain. Um, so HPSA scores, like I mentioned earlier, so one through 26 is the range. So this was absolutely maxed out HPSA scores. So we'll kind of talk more about that at the end, talking about um, community health centers and kind of what they can offer and things like that. But this was a very underserved population. So coming here was great. I actually worked six days a week when I was here. Um, and this was also during the height of COVID when I came. So whenever I got off the plane, they swabbed my nose. They kind of put me in a bus with a few other people and they had hazmat suits and all these things. They took us to a hotel, they got a key and kind of unlocked the door for us and said, Mr. Ross, here you go, here's your accommodation. We'll see you in six days. And then closed the door and locked it. Um, the way that they managed COVID in Saipan specifically was every arrival, every person that came in, they would have them quarantine in a hotel for five, six, seven days, do multiple rounds of COVID testing. And then when you got out after you tested negative and you could go do normal things, you didn't have to wear KN95 masks, N95 masks doing dental care. You could just wear your regular surgical masks. You could um, go to the grocery store without it being a big deal. You could, there wasn't any restrictions on that. So actually during this, we would be playing basketball out in the, out right next to the ocean and having a good time, like high-fiving each other, like all kinds of crazy stuff because COVID wasn't existing on the island. And it was very rare if there was ever an outbreak, but it was always really well controlled. Um, this was a really small, small island, like I said, so it was super peaceful. Um, we didn't have panoramic radiographs, so we only had PAs. We only had bite wings at the offices I worked at. Um, so we had had limitations on how we were able to diagnose and treatment plan things. Um, so this was kind of a challenge that I faced, um, but it's something that I think was a good challenge to have. And it kind of was a good perspective of, hey, if we don't have these, how can we still treatment plan these people to take care of them? Um, so this was a mountain kind of in the middle of the island. Here's the whole northern extent over here. So that's the tip of the island right there. And then here's the south, and then the south tip is over here. So a pretty small island, 50,000 people still on the island, but it was pretty spread out. Um, beautiful place. So this was the staffs that we had when I was there. So these were a lot of really nice Filipino workers for the most part. And then we had two local ladies who were both um, Chamorro, so the native population of Guam and the Northern Mariana, Northern Mariana Islands are called Chamorro. So we had kind of a good blend of a lot of really nice, hardworking people that all just had the same goal of let's help people and go from there. So this was kind of me playing basketball with some of my, some of my buddies here that I made. Um, this guy right here, you can see that he, he had a hobby that he liked to do while we were playing. So we would actually be playing basketball. He would make three-point shots. He was an amazing shot. And he would run by his buddy sitting on the sidelines, grab a cigarette, take a big puff of it, give it back, and keep playing. So kind of to go back to this point is that different populations have different um, different propensities for different diseases. And oral cancer was a big one in, in Saipan. Um, so a lot of times they'd be chewing betel nut. So I know we're kind of taught that specifically in our San Antonio programs that betel nut 
um, or a Rika nut. It's kind of a stimulant type of nut that you chew on and it really stains your teeth black. Um, so that's something that I would see a lot of. So I'd have a lot of these patients that have these really big stains. Um, these were all biopsied and they were sent for, sent for biopsy, sent for histology slides and everything. And they were um, precancerous lesions on all of these. So all these patients did have much higher risk. Thankfully, we were catching it early. This one, I think, was a mix of um, pyogenic granuloma and a little bit of a precancerous lesion as well. So these are some pretty cool cases that we had. Mm -hmm, same thing. And here's a little baby tooth. Pretty retained there. Wouldn't go in anywhere. It's a nice endo we had as well. Um, so this was the main basketball court I would play on. By the way, if anybody wants to buy some drone footage from me, I've got a side business. Just kidding. But um, I did take some pretty nice shots when I was there. So this was some. This was just a random day. I remember going to the basketball courts, and I remember thinking, "This is this is picturesque. This is something special." Um, and these are actually tanks that are in the water. So in um, during World War II, one of, some of the major battles that happened were out in the Pacific. Um, so the, these are the original World War II tanks that you can swim around. It was kind of like a, a monument that people don't really touch, but you're allowed to swim around it. There's fish all in it, um, that kind of thing. Also, vegans turn away here. This was a night spear fishing. So some of the local guys took me out spear fishing here. So we would do this and catch our own food. Um, this was a this was an octopus that I caught. Also, vegans turn away. So to kill the octopus, you, you can bite their brain. So if you notice the color change on that. So I'll do that one more time. I see some faces turning. Sorry about that. So one more time, watch the color change. Right there. So that's delivering the coup de gras to the octopus. And I did eat them. So that was that that was part of my meals, was kind of cooking and catching my own food and stuff like that. It was awesome. Um, so here's some of the travels I've been on since I've graduated dental school. This was in Honolulu. This was my main surfing spot when I was there. Um, here's the Tokyo Sky Tree. So that's something that's kind of cool for our Japanese listeners. Um, and the skydiving. Here's eating a crepe in front of the Eiffel Tower. Here's seeing Machu Picchu. This was after a long day um, on a dirt bike and then up at the Machu Picchu site. And here's Australia. So dentistry has afforded me a lot of, a lot of opportunities to go places um, that one to volunteer. So whenever I went to Peru, I actually did do a volunteer mission trip when I was there and served for about a week in one of the clinics there, which was great. Um, this was for my 30th birthday. I was in the Philippines on a boat celebrating my birthday, pretty quiet, normal stuff. Um, and then this was again, playing basketball with some of the local guys in the Philippines. So we played a couple games and after the first game, we played the first full set, things were normal. And then the second game, oh, my shoe came inside. I had to go and tie my shoe. And I looked around like, man, why is nobody needing to tie their shoe? And I looked around and I was the only one who was wearing closed toed shoes. Everybody else is wearing flip flops or they were barefoot. So it's a pretty, pretty nice lesson whenever you go places to put yourself in other people's shoes or whatever, whatever they have on their feet and to understand that the everybody's all the same. People have the same goals, but life is short. Don't be selfish and to make yourself useful because there's, there's, if you're given opportunities and you don't use them, it's a mistake. So this is kind of the, kind of the ending slide that I'll kind of end it with. And I'll kind of go a little bit more in depth with this and then I'll open it up for questions. I want to get y'all out early enough for lunch that y'all can enjoy a little bit more. Um, so other avenues that you can help an underserved population that include joining health services Corps. So it's kind of like a, it's almost kind of like a military contract in a way where you contract with um, a really connected network of health service and community, community clinic kind of organizations where they, you sign on for a couple of years and they have different places that they can send you kind of similar to the next point down called the Indian health service um, and other reservations. So they have, they have networks of these things where you can join. So you get your dental license and you go out to go, um, to start working and you look at different places you can go, these networks can kind of put you in different places. So you can say, hey, I really wanna to go to Alaska, for example. So the Indian Health Service has a pretty good grasp of the different, um, and they own clinics themselves of different places they can put you in Alaska and different things they can do with that. So that's a, that's a pretty cool way to do it. It's almost like a military contract in a way. And there is um, something I'm gonna mention as well, loan forgiveness options for a lot of these community health centers. 
So when you join these community health centers and you sign up for multiple years and your, if your HPSA score is high enough, they can actually give you anywhere from, I've heard in the range of 10 to even 40,000 of, of kind of a credit towards your student loans. So on top of the salary that you'd make, if you signed on for two years, they, they give you each year in that range of money, depending on the HPSA score and kind of the need for what they, um, the need for what they have at the time. So HPSA score is a big thing, like I mentioned earlier, about kind of finding the true places that need healthcare professionals. So a lot of times, if you go to a really well-populated city, there can still be places that are health profession shortage areas. But if you go to some of these outer islands and other places, like I've mentioned, it's pretty easy to find um, places that have those higher scores that can give you um, a little bit more loan forgiveness. Um, you can also do military missions and civilian contracts. So when I first got out, I was kind of interested in going to Korea or Japan. But one of the issues with that was because I wasn't in the military, dental licensure for those countries is a little difficult for one. And then two, um, a lot of times you can work kind of on base as a civilian contract in the military, and they'll kind of give you a waiver or kind of a workaround to where you can work in Korea or Japan or whatever it may be, but they typically leave those open for spouses of the military, which is kind of tough. So let's say your husband goes to Japan and you're a dentist and you need to go work. Um, a lot of times those civilian contracts are kind of left a little bit more preferentially towards people that have military spouses. Um, and like I mentioned, there is FQHCs all over the United States. There's pediatric school programs that go to schools and rotate through schools. Um, that's a pretty good option. There's VA hospitals. So I know that the Health Science Center here has kind of a close relationship with the VA hospital in San Antonio. Um, so I know that's a good option for a lot of people. And they, they do have residency programs and things like that as well. Um, obviously, you can work at the school. That's an option. And there is locum and kind of short-term contracts that you can do, which is kind of what I did. So my stuff was mostly leave coverage. So there was, for the first one to go to Honolulu, there was a, uh, one of the main providers was on leave. So she needed coverage while she was having her baby and kind of doing the whole maternity leave thing. Um, and the other one was for a vacation leave. So one of the dentists had just built up all this time throughout COVID to take off, but he couldn't use it because they didn't have coverage. So I covered for him um, while he was doing that. So that was great. And then one of the last options is also um, working in prisons. So there is kind of, those typically tend to be a little bit more outskirt areas, but that's also an option as well. So U.S. dental training does allow licensure um, to territories, commonwealths, and states. So that's obviously kind of a good blend of kind of these outer islands and things like that. So that was kind of my journey. So if you guys have questions, um, I'll leave that open for that. I'm curious if you guys have questions to ask and um, we can go from there. But yeah, that's the main part of my presentation. So thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Ross. There is a question in our chat already by Carlos Osorio, who is the dental student, and he wants to know if you can maybe share a website that he can learn more about some of these options. Um, if I'm you, I would take a screenshot of probably that last slide that I have and try to just Google them. There's not really great, um, there's not really one website that gives you this kind of information. It's kind of spread out. I know the ADA website has a, it has a list of different states licensure requirements and even territories, commonwealths, but there's not really one good source. So I've kind of had to piecemeal kind of find, even making this list, I kind of just had to brainstorm what are things that I've heard and what are things I've looked at. So there's not really a central source, unfortunately, but I mean, if you're interested in one more than the other one, obviously like the Indian Health Service, that's a pretty big website that's well connected. Um, each FQHC or federally qualified health center does kind of have their own website. So that's not going to be as easy as a source to find information about the whole umbrella um, of those. But I mean, the health service core, that's another one you could probably look at, but there is a lot of individual um, business websites. So it's, it's not really centralized, unfortunately. I wish it were, I wish it were a little easier to um, find that. Good question. I, I would like to ask actually those of us, those that, that are attending that are that work at federally qualified health centers. I know we've got quite a bit of dental staff, maybe a couple of dental directors on our on this meeting as well. If maybe you can give your perspective of, of what Dr. Ross shared with us, if anyone's willing to, to yeah, share that.
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Brownlee. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? All good. Okay. Um, so, Dr. Ross, I think you did an awesome job. Um, I am, um, as um, Professor De La Torre mentioned, I am a, uh, I am a public health service uh, resident, but I am also a, um, a public health service or dental officer for the United States Public Health Service. Um, that is one of the ways that you can find a lot of those various opportunities via um, their website. I will put it in the chat, but for a lot of the HRSA or the HIPSA scores that he was talking about, there is a link where you can kind of search per state. Um, it's via the HRSA connector. Tatiana, you're muted. Uh oh. There you go. I know that there's something going on with my audio, so I, I had issues initially. Um, but I'll put everything in the chat or any resources that I may have, but he did cover a lot. It is very hard to find them in all in one particular location, but uh, via the hersa.gov uh, website, as well as the other link for the public health service, you may be able to kind of track via the, the, for the public health service, there are different agencies that represent a lot of underserved area and the Indian health service is one of those. And a lot of, for a lot of those jobs, you can actually apply for the commission core uh, for a loan repayment, or you can apply as an individual contractor and go that route as well. But it, this is the area that opportunity is available for you. Yeah, thanks for your input. Um, another thing too with Indian Health Service is that they do recognize any state license. So the way that it works is you, each individual Indian Health Service reservation that has a community health center, which most of them do, they do have kind of a bypass that they can allow any state license to work because they are, I think, technically their own entity, almost kind of their own um, kind of government. They have their own systems that they can kind of recognize and use any state license is what I've been told. So I haven't done that specifically, but I've been told that if you have a Oregon state license, you can work in Oklahoma at the Indian Health Service Reservation or same with Alaska. So that's also something to consider as well. It's not restricted by state. So it's kind of restricted by um, each Indian Health Service reservation to give you a license from there. Do you have any other people who have input on those kind of things, loan forgiveness, um, different avenues that you can kind of look for these kind of things? Thank you, Dr. Ross. That was a great presentation. Um, I don't have any resources to share, but I, I just wanted to. Um, I I had one question. <laughs> it made me yeah. feel like I was traveling across Hawaii and the yeah. islands I found, <laughs> and that was very good. It was really good. Um, yeah, what you. and you've already mentioned some, but what were some of the challenges that you've encountered while you were working in these communities compared to working in San Antonio? Um, I think one of the bigger challenges was probably the technology. So in Saipan and I think in Honolulu, the office I was at, just the, the limitations of the equipment that we had was an issue. So to order parts, so for example, in Saipan, specifically I'll go into that, we had one of the x-ray machines go down to read PSP plates. So there was a time, I think there was like a day where we, we did have to close the office because the one PSP plate or the x-ray machine essentially stopped working. We weren't able to take x-rays. So I was able to find a kind of a small unit that was self-contained. So it was a digital sensor that had a little small screen on it that was about this big. So we could take an x-ray. I would have to take a picture with my phone. I'd email it to the office manager. She would upload it into the patient chart. And that's how we would take x-rays. So we would take them one at a time and I would take pictures with my phone, send it, and kind of do that whole thing. Meanwhile, in the United States, mainland, if that happens within the next day, typically you can have a representative come out to you, give you a new machine, they take your old one and make that whole thing work. 
But with the way that that stuff would work there, it would take months to order stuff. So we sent that machine out. We didn't get it back for, I think, two months. So for about two months, I was working just on a little box like this big, taking x-rays um, and saving them that way. It worked and it was fine, but it, it was more work that normally in the United States mainland, you wouldn't have to deal with. So that was kind of an interesting challenge that we had. And then also, like I mentioned, um, not having a panoramic x-ray. Most of us in modern training at least have a panoramic x-ray that we can work with and treatment plan and do that kind of thing. So having the, having the limitations of not having a panoramic was, was pretty difficult thing to front as well. Those were some of the challenges with Saipan specifically. Um, licensure itself for each of those places was pretty simple. Like um, actually looking up the requirements for each license wasn't too difficult, but sometimes meeting those requirements was hard. So for example, for Hawaii during my time, I think it's changed since, um, you had to take ADEX, which is a different type of licensing exam than REB, which is what we took. Now I think they've combined them and made it just one. Um, I think um, the Hawaiian state law has updated it to where if you have that combined test, that also works as well. Um, so one of the good things that came from COVID was they did consolidate licensure exams for dentists, where it's hopefully just that one qualifies for almost everything. So that was one of the good things that came out of that. So, and they did allow mannequin exams at the time. So that's kind of how I was able to get my full unrestricted license was during the height of COVID, I was able to do that. So, yeah. Thank you. Wait. Um, oh. Any questions or? Sorry. We have a question from Carlos. And would, Carlos, would you please, or would you mind unmuting and asking your question? Hi. Uh, I was wondering uh, what's the uh, scope of practice and if, do you ever have to um, perform other you know, procedures in like, different areas because of uh, a need? Uh, in, in those remote areas? Um, scope of practice was typically kind of as far as I wanted to take it usually. So there, there would be times where I'd be taking out wisdom teeth or I'd be doing some tough molar endo. Um, there wasn't any true restrictions. So kind of the way that dentistry works is lo as long as you can justify, and this is, this is mainly the United States um, in territories, commonwealths, pretty much wherever. Um, dentistry works in the sense that you can take it almost as far as you feel comfortable doing. But, but the issue with that is, is if you do run into trouble. So for example, there were times where I would look at a case and I'd say, you know what, if I can't, if I can't take this tooth out or if this is so close that, to the nerve that it may cause an issue, I can't bail myself out of it. If I can't correctly do this, I don't have a way to fix it. That's kind of your own limitations. And that's kind of the same thing, whether you're remote or whether you're not. With remote, I think there's a little bit of a push to where you say, you know what, I think I do need to try this or else this patient's going to for sure end up in a hospital. If I don't take out this wisdom tooth, they're for sure going to have a problem. Um, but it's typically kind of limited by yourself. So even placing implants, doing Invisalign, um, as long as you have a dental license and you've had the training and you can kind of show that you've trained it and you can show that you're competent in it, that's where it really cuts off. But there's not a, there's not a hard line saying that, let's say you do an implant, for example, and it's not placed well, it causes a problem. Um, there's a general dentist can place an implant legally, as long as it's to the standard of a specialist. And I'm sure that's, that's kind of the important frame that needs to be noted. If it's done to the standard of a specialist who's been had the extra years of training, if a general dentist can do it, then technically that's the answer. But it's, it's a problem whenever you've gone beyond your scope or gone beyond your comfort level, and you get to a point where you can't be bailed out of that that's kind of where the issues lie and being in really remote rural areas sometimes I felt like I was pushed a little harder to do it but the patients needed it and if they didn't it was a flight to Guam it was a you had to stay a week so there were patients I would see for wisdom teeth specifically saying hey I need to get this wisdom tooth out but if you can't do it I've been told I have to fly to Guam quarantine there for a week get the tooth taken out fly back quarantine for a week when I land back in Saipan so getting a tooth done is a two to three week ordeal, getting a tooth taken out. So they say, hey, um, I'm willing for you to try it if it's within the range of safety. But the alternative is, the alternative is if it's not and you can't safely do it, then it's a three week issue to minimum to get it fixed. So in those kind of situations, I would really sit down with patients and say, what are your what are your concerns? How do we do this? Because if this does happen, we do have a big problem that you're going to have to fly anyway. So it was it was kind of a it was a push to up my up my game and kind of up my abilities, but there's no true limitations. Okay, thank you. Good question. Yeah. Uh, 
Are there any questions, um, Dr. Ross, regarding his side of the presentation or anything in general? And again, sorry, this one was a little bit short. I'm used to having an audience and kind of having a full thing. So sorry about no, this, that. Sorry for being a little short. This is great. I know that there's a lot of dental students in our audience, and I just wondered if they have any additional questions and if this has piqued their curiosity about their future, as well as, as I think the way you put it, Dr. Ross, about sharing your skills and, and mm -hmm. helping beings of help to so many people that need, need help, need dental care. Yeah. Any, any students that maybe want to share a little bit about the inside from today's uh, presentation? If none of the students want to, I do know names, but I won't do that. If we're not in class, that's okay. But um, what I was going to ask also is how about those of you who work in community health centers? Can you give us any of your insight or who have had experience in uh, the community health centers? And there is a question from Carlos. Um, would you like to unmute and ask? Uh, sure. I was wondering if uh, typically the organizations, do they cover the travel expenses and the housing uh, while you're providing services? Or, I mean, does that vary or is that standard? Uh, that's pretty much my question. Yeah. Um, it varies some. So I will say that I do think nurses and physicians get a little bit better, um, I forget what they call it, but essentially benefits. They, they get a little better benefit working for hospitals. Um, I did get, I think I had my flights covered. On a couple of those, I had my flights covered, but I did pay for my own housing. I did pay for my own rental cars, um, things like that. But I did have some flights covered, not all of them. And those were kind of negotiated. But typically, if you're a physician or if you're a nurse doing locum tenens contracts, they cover a little bit better. They'll give you rental car, housing, uh, flights, all that stuff. But being a dentist, we get a, it, it's such a rarer thing that people don't really do this, that they don't really, um, they don't really have that as a standard or a, a very normal thing. So that was one thing I did kind of have to negotiate a little bit with or just kind of factor into the cost of what I was doing. So I wish in, in, a, in a better world, Locum tenants, dentists do better and they have a little bit easier time, but I've kind of had to bridge a bunch of those gaps myself and it's an unfortunate thing, but yeah. Okay. Good question, thanks. And I see a comment from Sanchez. A4, would you like to um, elaborate? Can you even elaborate on it? Um, the maybe just a comment. Yeah, maybe that's just a comment that, that they're making. Yeah. That they're working. Um, yeah. We'd see anywhere from probably about 15 to probably 25 patients per day. I think that would be kind of the, the normal, not not 20 to 30 a.m. and p.m. We wouldn't see that many, but we would see anywhere from probably 15 to 25 a day. So not quite at that pace. I see another question there. Um Compensation compared to private practice was, in theory, private practice, you can make more. Um, assuming you have the patient load, assuming you have the right collections and your pay structure and everything, but I'd call it comparable because with benefits and everything and the way that it works, a lot of the private practice, um, call it associate jobs you'd get, um, are much more based on production, collections, that kind of thing. But this being hourly, if you could find good places and get kind of the right rates, then very, very comparable, if, if not sometimes even more. Um, when I was in Maui, I had really good health insurance. I got full eye exam, the whole thing, all covered, all medical expenses, pretty much um, pretty much free. So 
So that was kind of a big thing. Typically, they have really good uh, health insurance benefits, which you'll find will be pretty expensive if you have your own um, from private practice. But um, yeah. Yeah, and you have true PTO. That's another thing that was kind of nice. I'd have paid time off, which was not a thing in private practice. And yeah, I, I agree. The, the, the benefits do kind of stack up when you add a PTO and all those other things as well. So yeah, and if, and if you do the loan repayment options and you sign on for multiple years, I think that's a pretty good, that's not something that I did, but if you factor that in, then it can be comparable, if not more sometimes, depending on which health center and how remote, sometimes the pay is, I would say, notably better than um, with sign-on bonuses, loan repayment, and the actual salary itself can be better. But I was kind of interested in just kind of short-term contracts, so something to consider. Yeah. So a question, Dr. Ross, is where do you plan to go next after your um, residency? I'm not sure yet. I, I think I, I have a vision for myself that hopefully I'd have a base probably in Honolulu, and then from there, with my radiology work, kind of work, um, work maybe three or four days a week, maybe work a day or two in a community health clinic, and then kind of flex, kind of flex my schedule to where I can go travel and go to different places, work in other remote areas, or just kind of work from a laptop and be sitting on a beach, hanging out somewhere. So I probably have a have a home base in Honolulu, but I'm not for sure. So we'll see. All over. Hopefully by the end of it. Hopefully the whole world. That's my hope. But we'll see. Aim high. <laughs> There you go. And just out of curiosity, are there anyone um, in this learning network who's um, experienced something similar to what Dr. Ross is doing? So going um, abroad or somewhere far to provide services to, to communities in need. Um, if you can share with us some experiences, that would be amazing since we have a few more minutes left of session. Well, we have, yep. <laughs> no, I was going to say, while we have more people chime in, I'm sure people will have some additional comments. I just wanted to ask kind of what that process was like for uh, Dr. Ross when, when you were just finding and identifying these areas. Um, would you just apply and then would they interview you remotely uh, via Zoom before going? Or, you know, how much research would you do on? Um, on the various sites that you decided to, to go out and provide care to. Yeah, so I would often times find the job openings like on Indeed or Monster or something like that. So pretty typical um, recruiting websites and then kind of get contact info. A lot of times they would have some of the stuff listed out. Hey, here's this opportunity, it's for this long. Um, here's kind of what we expect, here's what you'll do. And then I would apply to it, send in my resume, do all that stuff, and then do kind of a Zoom interview kind of thing. And they'd say green light, and then I'd pack my backpack in a suitcase and get on the road and get to it. Um, and then for the most part, after kind of that main interview, they'd kind of say, here's what we expect. Here's what we're aiming for for pay. What are you expecting from us? How do we do this? And kind of just finding them on those regular recruiting websites. It wasn't anything... Um, specific. It wasn't a specific website, but once I would find their opening, I'd go to their website, look up stuff, see what they do, and kind of go from there, do my own research with their websites, typically that were pretty easy to find. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Ross? Um, and we can um, conclude the session a few minutes early. Um, uh, thank you for joining us um, for the 12th Stent Echo session. And thank you particularly to Dr. Ross for um, sharing with us um, a lot of your experience, knowledge. Um, thank you. Um, we uh, Please complete the post-session survey. Um, the link, um, I believe, uh, Dr. Aguilar shared on the in the chat. Um, and we hope to see you in two months, um, which will be in March uh, for our next Stand Echo session. Um, thank you.